have your Bibles, find Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 34. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 34. In Luke 22, verse 31, on the eve of the crucifixion, Jesus turns to Peter, Luke 22, 31, and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded or petitioned to have you to sift or thresh you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison or to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day till you have denied me three times. Let us first of all notice here what Jesus sees. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, I see something. To behold something is to see it. Now notice that he addresses Peter as Simon twice. Simon, Simon, behold. Has anybody ever spoke to you, spoke your name twice? My mother <clears throat> used to look at my grade card when I'd bring it home from high school or elementary or junior high. And she'd look at my grade card and she'd say, Larry, Larry. It's hardly ever good. In Luke 10, 41, Jesus is visiting in, with his disciples in the home of Mary and Martha. And Mary's taking advantage of the situation by sitting at his feet and listening. And Martha is in the kitchen preparing this huge meal. And she comes out frustrated and says, Jesus, would you please say something to Mary to help me in the kitchen? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha. You can almost see, you know, every time somebody repeats your name, it's, they always shake their head like, oh man, what are we going to do with you? In Acts chapter 9, verse 4, Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul the Apostle, is headed to Damascus to arrest Christians. And Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. and The light is so bright, the power is so great, it knocks him off his horse. And Jesus says to Saul, Acts 9, 4, Saul, Saul, repeats it twice. When somebody says, Larry, Larry, Simon, Simon, then we know that there's, do we call it disappointment? A dose of reality about your life? Peter said, Lord, I will go with you to death. I'm ready to suffer prison for you. Simon, Simon. There's an awakening coming. See, the truth is we don't know ourselves. We don't know our failures like Jesus does. Jesus knew Peter's failures before Peter did. Simon, Simon. And Jesus sees the activity of Satan before he acts. 
and he has to get permission. Have you noticed that? He has, he has demanded to have you. Well, why, why does he need Jesus' permission? Because Jesus is Lord. So Satan has to come to Jesus to get to Peter. And Jesus saw what Satan was up to. And the permission was given in measure because of Peter's pride. I'll never do that. I'll never leave you. I promise. All these others, they may, but not me. I'll go to the death for you. <laughs> he couldn't even stand up to a little girl at the fire outside the prison. So what Jesus saw was failure. What he saw was Satan's activity. What he saw was Peter's heart and weakness. But let's look at what Satan wants. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you to sift you like wheat. Uh, first of all, that word you, he's demanded to have you, that's actually in the plural, in the Greek text. He's demanded all of you. He wants all the disciples. Satan's goal is not small. He wants to get every single one of you. All the, he, he's addressing Peter, but Peter's kind of the representative of the group. And he's saying, Simon, he wants to just take this whole bunch and thresh you like wheat. What is it to be threshed like wheat? Well, in that first century context, they had uh, threshing floors. And uh, give, me, give me the picture. If you'll notice, they have this threshing floor and uh, they have the oxen walking in the threshing floor because the weight of those oxen, as they went round and round, and, got, and they walked on the wheat, it, 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 it threshed the wheat. Sometimes they would have several animals walking in a circle to thresh the wheat. And then they would take a pitchfork, toss up the, the straw into the air and the wind would blow it away. So what does Satan want to do? He wants to walk on you. Satan wants you under his feet. He wants to thresh you like wheat, that is, beat you down. An Old Testament verse, Isaiah 51, 23 says, Your tormentors said to you, Fall prostrate that we may walk on you. And you made your back like the ground, like a street to be walked on, Isaiah 51, 23. You just laid down and he walked on you like a street. A street is something you walk on continually. You just stay there and just be our street. <laughs> That's what he wants. One of his favorite tactics is once you have failed... He comes to you and he says, well, you might as well just stay there. There's no point in getting up now. So Satan loves to not only knock you down, keep you down and push you further. I like the, the contemporary version of Isaiah 51, 23. It says, they ordered you to get down on the ground so they could walk all over you and you had to do it. Flat on the ground, you were dirt under their feet. Satan does not have high standards for you. He does not have your best interest at heart. That's what Satan wants. 
Now what stands in the way? Look at the, look at the next verse. He says, Simon, Satan's demanded to thresh you like wheat, walk on you, tread you down. But what stands in his way? Verse 32. But I, but, that's a big but. <laughs> you know, there's some big buts in the Bible. Listen to Genesis 50, 20. Joseph has been sold into slavery, put into prison, and his brothers, as the years go by, they come to him and, he, and Joseph says, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. That's a big but. Acts 13, 29 says they took him down from the cross and laid him in a grave, but God raised him from the dead. Philippians 2, 27, he was sick nigh to death, but God had mercy on him. Ephesians 2, 3, we were by nature children of wrath like others, but God is rich in mercy and he made us alive. All the way through, the, the difference between the believer and the difference between others and ourselves is but God. But God meant it for good. But God raised him up. But God had mercy on him. But God quickened and made us alive when we were dead in trespasses and sins. But God. What stands in the way here? Jesus puts this big butt here. And let me give you the obstacles to Satan's design on your life. He wants to tread you down under his feet. But, look at verse 32. I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. Here is the first thing that Jesus does to make sure Satan doesn't accomplish his will in your life. I have prayed for you that your faith not be eclipsed. I have prayed for you. Notice past tense. And this is remarkable. Before, not only before Peter sinned, before Peter even knew he was going to sin, Jesus had already prayed for him to the Father on his behalf and obtained recovery. <laughs> Amen? Man, come on, people. That's wonderful. Before Peter had even known he was going to sin, the sin he was going to commit, Jesus had already taken care of it and obtained his recovery. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, the high priest had tremendous merit and power. He, the high priest, would go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, and there he would represent people. And God would listen to the high priest, and because of the high priest, he would forgive the people. In Numbers 35, there's an example of this, that if somebody is a, accidentally kills somebody, he's a, called a manslayer, manslaughter. We call it manslaughter. If he accidentally does this, uh, he can flee to a, a city of refuge. They, had, uh, they would give permission to family members to be an avenger of blood if the family member uh, lost their life to some accidental negligence of a neighbor. That neighbor could flee to a city of refuge and there the avenger of blood, the prosecutor, persecutor, could not get to them inside that city of refuge. And here's what it says, Numbers 35, verse 26, if the manslayer at any time goes outside the boundaries of the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of the city of refuge. 
and the avenger of blood kills that manslayer, he shall not be guilty. For the, he must remain inside the city until the high priest dies. In other words, he's protected from the prosecutor and the persecutor and the avenger. He's protected inside that city of refuge as long as the high priest is alive. So I would imagine this guy is saying, Lord, please let the high priest be healthy today. Once the high priest dies, the city fathers put him out. You're on your own now, friend. In other words, the presence of the high priest in the Holy of Holies representing the people saved him. What if the high priest, what if you had a high priest who never died? What if you have blood on your hands, you have sins in your life, but you have a high priest and he never dies. That would be awesome. And so we find in Hebrews chapter 7 where it says that Hebrews 7, 24, he holds his priesthood permanently because he lives and continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession. Did you know you are secure before God as long as Jesus lives? And that's a long time. Amen. Amen. So he tells Simon Peter, Satan wants to have you. He's going to beat you down. I'm going to let him do it for a little, by, a little while just to deal with the prideful heart that you've got. But I have prayed for you that your faith not fail. Have you been through a period like that? A valley? Darkness? And yet in the worst times of your life, you think... I still believe in God. I still believe Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I still believe He was resurrected from the dead. Take it a little further. I still believe He ascended to the right hand and is there interceding on my behalf and therefore I will recover. That's, you got to just take it a little farther. And that's what Peter is being told by Jesus here. So what is that stands in the way? What, what's the but that follows? But I have prayed for you. Here's a second thing. Notice in verse 32, I've prayed for you that your faith not completely be eclipsed, is the meaning. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned again. So I, I call this the purpose of Jesus doesn't change. His prayers for you and his purpose for you. As somebody said, he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. The purpose Jesus had for Peter is the same in his failure as it was when he first came to Jesus. John 1, 42. Andrew, Peter's brother, brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, that is Peter, and said, so you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means a rock, a stone, solid, reliable. That's who you're going to be. Here's who you are. Let me tell you who you're going to be. So he tells Peter, uh, Peter, you're going to recover. And when you are, you continue to lead the brothers, strengthen them, encourage them, share your testimony with them, let them know 
The purpose of Jesus did not waver. So in Acts 1, when they need, when Judas commits suicide, they need a, another apostle. It's Peter who steps up and addresses the congregation and tells them how to do it. In Acts 2, it's Peter who stands up on the day of Pentecost and preaches the first sermon of the early church. It's just a couple of months later. The prayers of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus. One third thing. He says, but I, the presence of Jesus. Jesus himself is the key to recovery. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4 through 8, <clears throat> Paul is describing the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. Here's the way he puts it. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. He was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 at one time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles at the same time. Thomas was included in that one. Finally, he, he appeared to me also, Paul says. There are six appearances there. If you count the women who saw him when he first came out of the tomb, at seven post-resurrection appearances. It says he appeared to the twelve. Well, we know that because the Gospels talk about it, John 20 and 19. He appeared to the 500, that's probably Matthew 20, 18. He appeared to all of them at the same time. That's when he said to, to Thomas, put your finger in my wounds see that it's me. He appeared to Paul. We know that from Acts 9 when he was converted. But look at the top of the list. His, his very first person that he appeared to, Cephas, the rock. He not only didn't give up on the per on the purpose that he had for him, but his presence came and he appeared. There's no record of that. We don't read anywhere that Jesus appeared to Peter. That must have been some private conversation right there. Peter, I'm sure, wept asked for forgiveness, understood. Peter from that time became truly Cephas, the rock, the stable one, reliable. John MacArthur speaks of this when he says, we are not told why the Lord appeared to Peter first or separately than the others but probably because of Peter's remorse over having denied the Lord. In going to Peter first, Jesus emphasized his grace. Peter had forsaken the Lord, but the Lord had not forsaken Peter. Christ did not appear to Peter because Peter deserved to see him most, but because Peter needed to see him most. Amen. Amen. What a Savior. What a wonderful Savior that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what stands in Satan's way? The prayers of our high priest, Jesus. The purpose he has that is unchanged. And the presence of Jesus himself coming to us. These are roadblocks. Satan may get a temporary measure of defeat in our life. But, but it has to go through Jesus and it'll be measured only to get the pride out of us, only to humble us and to make us come back stronger, more mature, more humble, more like Jesus than ever before. In other words, Satan, I'd hate to be him. He always ends up, everything he does, it ends up helping his people, God's people. 
the prayers, the purpose, and presence of Jesus, there's, those are roadblocks Satan cannot overcome. Amen.